300 years before Fatima, Our Lady gave a warning about the terrible crisis that the church and society would suffer in the 20th century. She appeared under the title of Our Lady of Good Success to a conceptionist nun in the royal convent of the Immaculate Conception in the then colony, the then Spanish colony of Quito. And she asked this holy soul to become a victim for her times, which she showed her. What did she see? There would be an apostasy in the clergy. These were the predictions she made. Heresies, blasphemies, and sacrilege would abound so that there would be an almost extinguishing of the light of faith. Sacraments would be abused and set aside. Vocations would perish, and orders would leave their original rules that gave such blessings. There would be an almost complete corruption of customs. Filthy waters of a flood of impurity would inundate the streets, causing a corruption so complete that the innocence of children would be almost completely destroyed, and there would be almost no virgin souls. In short, Mother Mariana saw what we are living in today, and she offered her sufferings as an expiatory victim. Our Lady told Mother Mariana to have a statue made, depicting her exactly as she appeared to her in these apparitions, the Christ child in her left hand, and the abbess crozier and the keys to the convent in her right. She had two reasons. First, she wants to be abbess, and she sits on the abbess seat inside the convent in the upper choir, and she comes down so the public can see her only twice a year. Now it's three times a year because there's so many pilgrims coming. But for centuries, it was just twice a year she would come down. No wonder you could say, you can understand why she was so little known, because most of the time she sat in the abbess chair in the upper choir. But she wanted to be there for her daughters, because she knew there would be many much suffering inside the convent, and she wanted to be their mother and the abbess. The second reason she wanted the statue, because it would have an important role for the future, so that the faithful souls of the 20th century especially could have recourse to her in their trials and sufferings. You can imagine a 16th century nun being told that this statue was for the 20th century and that the people of this century would have what I just said that we have, that you know that we have. It's incomprehensible to a Catholic in the 16th century that the times could deteriorate like they've deteriorated. Why haven't we heard about this important apparition? that has the church, it's had the church approval for 400 years. This is constant church approval. Every bishop in Quito since 1611 has given their approval to this this apparition. Why were the prophecies not known until now? Our Lady saved, so to speak, these prophecies for our times. Once when Mother Mariana protested that she wanted to remain hidden and unknown in the convent, Our Lady assured her, you will be, because your time will not be until the 20th century. She told her that for three centuries, this apparition would be wrapped in a mysterious silence because she was reserving knowledge of it for the 20th century. She told Mother Mariana that a great crisis in the church would begin in the middle of the 20th century and that only then would this devotion become known because it would be a remedy for that crisis. Our Lord himself promised Mother Mariana in one vision to work miracles, spiritual as well as physical, material, for the devout faithful, quote, of those times, for in that period hell would be unleashed and many souls would be lost. Indeed, these three centuries of mysterious silence is in a way an affirmation of the truth of the prophecies. Every prophecy of Mother Mariana so far that she made has been proven. The postulator for the cause, Monsignor Cadena y Almeida, who died just recently, he's written book after book on these, on these apparitions. They all have the imprimatur of the Archbishop of Quito. This book, he takes all the prophecies 
and shows how every single one has come to Capen exactly as she said. The only one that still remains is the chastisement and triumph to come. But everything else has been proven completely. Those three centuries of silence descended on the apparition, just like Our Lady told Mother Mariana. The statue was honored and loved in the convent, but their sisters in their sufferings would have recourse to Our Lady who sat in the abbess seat. But the miraculous origin of the statue, which was completed by the three archangels and St. Francis in the year 1611, right before its anointing, and the many prophecies and marvels of Mother Mariana's life were lost in the mists of history. That fog began to lift in 1906, when during a remodeling of the convent, which by the way is a whole, um, it's a whole block in the main square of Quito. It's an incredible convent, once filled with sisters. Today the number, like everywhere, has been reduced. It's like 13 to 20 at most um, that are full sisters. So you see, again, uh, prophecies come to truth. Vocations would perish. They were doing this remodeling, and they opened the sarcophagus where Mother Mariana was buried and the six founding mothers, and they found all bodies incorrupt, completely incorrupt. Well, you would think that would cause a great uproar, but during that period, 1906, this was the period of time when Alvaro was um, president. He was an anti-clerical, um, who, is, who was making legislation to try to take all the convent from the nuns, change secular education, even introduced a divorce in 1906. And so the sisters were fighting for their very lives there to keep the convent, to keep it from being usurped by the government, which was completely anti-clerical. And so this also just kind of disappeared in the midst of history. When the operation began to be known, do you know where they found those bodies? They were in the basement under material. They had them laid out, all those incorrupt bodies, because they had been kind of forgotten, even though it was so important and it was a miracle. It's kind of amazing, isn't it? The, um, there's one funny story there, that when they, when they realized in the 60s, when people started, 70s, started to come and visit and wanted to see the bodies of the, of the mother of the sisters, the nuns were embarrassed because they were under cloths. So the mother superior made a um, glass cases for all of them. And one of them was too small. So they had they said they were going to break the bones of the sister to fit her in. And the mother superior said, no. And she said, under obedience, I order you to fit. And she did. <laughs> <laughs> That's the faith of Quito. If you go to Quito, you see there's still something of that Catholic faith and spirit. Miracles on streets. There's a much different spirit than the American spirit here. Even though these were modern sisters in many ways, they still have faith and they still believe in the vow of obedience. It's incredible stories, they're very beautiful. So what happened? What happened, it was only, as Our Lady said, at the end of the 20th century, an interest began to grow unexpectedly in the miraculous statue. Groups of curious pilgrims filtered in and out, and the prophecy started to be known. At the end of the 1980s, I accidentally stumbled on this statue. I was on my way to Brazil on a pilgrimage, and our plane had an unexpected stop in Quito. Our guide, it happened that Our Lady was out on one of those two times a year. And we, the guide said, I want to show you something very beautiful. Saw the statue, and I realized it was not just beautiful, it was marvelous. It has a sheen, no picture does her justice. She has a sheen, a uh, supernatural air. She glows. And this is a statue that's been untouched for four, three centuries, four centuries now. Um, she has a presence. And I knew it was something very, very important and very beautiful. I wanted to know her history. And a few years later, the 400-page manuscript of Father Manuel Sousa Pereira fell into my hands. This is. This, he, was a, he was a monk from 1790 who was converted by Mother Mariana. He came to Quito from Portugal, from Spain to Quito, 
and he eventually became the confessor for the convent. He had access to all the sources, all the documents, the autobiography written by Mother Mariana herself, the convent records, and he wrote this definitive 400-page manuscript from which the prophecies come. I started translating it, and I realized it was a great treasure for our times. I offered my translation to several persons to publish, but none would accept. Fearful, for, perhaps, because of the backlash from church authorities that could come from prophecies that predicted a terrible apostasy inside the church that touched even the very pinnacle of the authority. No one wanted to print something like that. The opportunity came in 1997 to write a series of articles for Catholic Monthly, Catholic Family News. And these were extremely well received, incredibly received. This good reception resulted in this first small book, Our Lady of Good Success, Prophecies for Our Times. It was a small book, easy to read, and it's just a brief resume of Father Pereira's manuscript that was published some years later. I can't leave out here the role of Mr. Attila Gimaraes. We were working on translating that 11-volume collection that some of you know about who were here when he spoke about the errors of Vatican II, when he stopped and he said, let's put this down. We need to publish a work on Our Lady of Good Success because she needs to be known before the end of the century. The book came out in 1999. That book is in its fifth edition, and I truly believe Our Lady's helping to spread this message that she saved for 300 years precisely to help those who would be suffering from the confusion and chaos of our times. They are prophecies. How do they help? They confirm the crisis in the church. Second, they point to the causes. Third, they offer a great hope of a triumph and a victory of Our Lady, who will initiate a grand restoration for our Holy Mother Church. And in this way, they totally coincide and confirm the vision of Fatima. Two approved version, um, apparitions of the Church. And one confirms the other. I thought the best way to introduce this topic to this audience, perhaps some who don't, who know little about Our Lady of Good Success. I recognize some faces, and I know they know a lot, so they'll have to bear with it, <laughs> because I think a little history is a, it will help a lot. I'm going to give several episodes, first from the life of Mother Mariana, and then go to several of the most important prophecies. Why Mother Mariana? Because Our Lady herself said that she was inseparable from the apparition of Our Lady of Good Success. I hope this will pique your interest to read more. The two small books are short, very easy to read, and they have the prophecies, which were intended for us, and they do a great deal of good to the soul. In 1566, almost a century before the pilgrims, I like to say this to the Americans, in 1566, which is a century before the pilgrims put their feet on, the U on, on American soil. King Philip II was already sending a group of nuns to Quito to help build the Catholic civilization and culture there. This is something most Americans, we need a new history book that shows our Catholic history in the Americas, especially even here in California, Texas, New Mexico, where there, were, there, were, there was so much happening long before those stupid pilgrims put their feet on our land. <laughs> so, in 1566, King Philip II asked his relative, Mother Mariana de Jesus Taboada, to found a Conceptionist convent in Quito. It's interesting to note, this is the first Spanish convent of sisters in Quito. It also is very early in the Conceptionist order. The Conceptionist order was founded by Beatrice de Silva, Saint Beatrice de Silva, who was a Portuguese who went to Spain, founded the convent, only at age 56 did she do that because Our Lady told her that she would found a convent and she had to wait till the end of her life. But that convent gave us Venerable Mary of Agreda. Mary, Venerable Mary of Agreda was born around the same time as Mother Mariana de Jesus Torres, 
And that convent gave us Mother Mariana de Jesus Torres and Our Lady of Good Success. It's very interesting. Her niece was Mariana de Jesus Torres, who was 13 years old. She was from Biscay in northern Spain. And she was asked to accompany the six founding mothers, a girl of 13. Imagine that, crossing an ocean voyage that you knew you would never see your daughter again. She knew that she could lose her life, but that was the zeal and the spirit and the maturity of soul of the people of that time. From youth, Mother Mariana had a very precocious religious spirit, which was recognized by her Franciscan confessor and family. At her first communion at age nine, she was given permission to receive communion early because at that time, everyone received their first communion at 13 or 14. At her first communion, the Blessed Virgin appeared to her in a first ecstasy, and she explained to her the grandeur of the vow of virginity. And she asked this of her and told her that she was destined to be a religious of the Immaculate Conception in the New World and that one day she would see her. The girl accepted and she felt her soul inflamed with an ardent desire to carry out this mission. During the crossing of the ocean to the New World a year later in 1576, a terrible storm rose on the ocean and threatened to sink the ship. All were frightened. The sailors had given up hope. Young Mother Mariana saw a monstrous serpent with seven heads trying to destroy the ship, and she heard a terrible voice that said, I shall not permit this foundation. I shall not permit it to endure until the end of times, and I will persecute it unceasingly. Then Mother Mariana saw a beautiful lady carrying a child in her left hand, and in her right hand she carried a, a, a cross, and at the top of the cross was a lance. And the child took the hand of the lady and directed it, and they slayed all the serpents, and the waters became calm. Everyone in the ship was amazed. How could this be for the waters to calm so quickly? Later, she told her aunt, Mother Mariana de Jesus Taboada, that she, what she had seen, not only had she seen the serpent slayed and vanquished by Our Lady, with her hand directed by Christ. And I think there's something prophetic even in that, because you see that the victory will belong to Our Lady, but directed by the hand of Christ, who will be there to direct that slaying of the final serpent in our times. But she also saw many future events. She saw all the vocations that would flourish in the community, the faithful and the unfaithful souls. She also saw that one day Our Lady would appear to her and it's believed that she received on that date, at age 13, the gift of prophecy. This vision is significant. Why do I include it? Because we can see the hatred of Satan from the very beginning for this foundation and for the role it would play in our times. It's almost impossible for us to understand the next phase of Mother Mariana de Jesus' life. Her desire for a life of immolation and sacrifice her disciplines, fastings, prayers, they were enormous, only like the 16th century Spanish people could do. They had an ability to suffer, a desire to suffer for our Lord, that today we would be called, I don't know, some crazy. And they understood it as a great love for, for God. One would expect that this would make her very loved in the convent, her holiness. And she was indeed very loved by the founding mothers, the six founding mothers and her own aunt, who saw in her a model of virtue in their youngest member. But the native sisters, it raised their envy and jealousy, as so often happens. Goodness is rewarded with that. <laughs> they say that um, mother, in, if you read the City of God, Venerable Mary of Agreda says that Our Lady, when she went to the temple, she was treated that way. The other virgins there tormented her out of jealousy. It's a very interesting to read that and to see that happening again to Mother Mariana. So we come to her first mysterious death in 1582 and the start of her prophetic mission for our times. 
She was 19 years old. She had just suffered a great deal at the hands of the other sisters. And she went to pray before the, before the tabernacle. And Christ himself emerged, suffering as he did at Golgotha, with Our Lady at his feet, shedding tears. What was Mother Mariana's first reaction? My lady, am I to blame for this? Our Lady responded, no, not you, but the criminal world of the 20th century. Then our Lord, as he began his agony, she heard the voice of the Eternal Father saying, this punishment will be for the 20th century. And she saw three swords come over the head of our Lord. On one were the words, I will punish heresy. On the second, I will punish blasphemy. And on the third, I will punish impurity. With this, she was given to understand all that would take place in the church and in the society in our era. Our Lady asked, my daughter, will you sacrifice yourself for the people of this time? She replied, I am willing. And immediately the three swords left the place where they were over Christ's head and they plunged into her heart. And the pain of the three swords entering her heart left her dead. She appeared before the judgment seat of God, and our Lord offered her two crowns. One was a crown of eternal glory, the other a crown of lilies strewn with thorns. Taking the first, she would remain in eternal celestial happiness. The latter, she would return to suffer in the world. Her first desire was to remain in heaven. But Our Lady approached her and said, My daughter, I left the glories of heaven and descended to earth to protect my children. I desire you imitate me in this and return to life, for your life is most necessary for the order of my conceptionists. Woe to the colony and to the world in the 20th century. She then explained the need for sacrificial souls to appease divine justice in all times and how those sacrificial souls would be lacking in the 20th century. As a consolation, Our Lady promised to her that throughout time there would always be a faithful daughter inside her convent that she would establish who would serve that role of appeasing divine justice, who would suffer like her, and that that convent would remain till the end of the world. In fact, Mother Mariana did indeed die in 1582, a fact noted in the archives and the books of the convent and attested to by the doctor who came to, to attest to that she had, she had died. Her remarkable return to life was also duly noted in the convent books. By the way, Mother Mariana has, the, has an amazing record on deaths. She died three times. <laughs> Finally, the third time, when she was 72, and um, that was her final death. But when she was 26, this was, um, this was seven years later, she had a second death. After a year of suffering a dark night of the soul and a mysterious illness that left her in terrible pain and all her limbs immobile, she couldn't move, Our Lady came to dissipate the interior suffering, but that did not, the, but the um, physical suffering, illness, continued. She worsened, she got sicker and sicker, and finally the sisters gave up hope and at 3.30 on Good Friday, surrounded by the mothers and sisters, she raised her eyes to heaven and died. Her body was prepared for burial. All this is recorded in the convent. And then on the third day, because they always waited three days before they buried, it was Easter Sunday, and the sisters went to pray in the morning office, the 4 a.m. morning office, and they saw Mother Marianne in her place. And they screamed as they thought it was a ghost. And they ran to the Mother Abbess. And Mother Abbess came and Mother Mariana. They saw that her body was no longer in the bier. And she had returned to life. This second death was a purification that prepared her for her prophetic mission and for the first apparition of Our Lady of Good Success that would come six years later when Our Lady told her she wanted the statue to be made that would be do a great good for the convent and for those faithful and suffering souls of the 20th century. She meant for this statue to do us a good, so we should take advantage of that good that she wanted for us. <laughs>